So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'll start in the 10th verse. The Bible says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me, is a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Steve Lohr is a writer for the New York Times, and he was writing about Steve Jobs, who was one of the founders of Apple Computer. And Steve Jobs made a lot of money over the years for himself, for Apple shareholders, but money never seemed to be Steve Jobs' primary motivation. And so in the late 90s, Steve Lohr and Steve Jobs are walking near Jobs' home in Palo Alto, California. And internet stocks are getting bubbly. And Steve Jobs starts talking about the proliferation of startups. And he says this, he says, with so many young entrepreneurs focused on the exit strategy, in other words, selling their companies for a quick and hefty profit, he said it's such a small ambition and a sad reality. And then Steve Jobs said this. He said, they should want to build something that lasts. And, you know, whether you're building a company, whether you're building a life, whether you're building a building, you know, do you want to build something that lasts or do you just want to build something that will turn a quick buck? Do you want to build something that lasts, that endures? You know, the Apostle Paul likens... our lives to a building. And he referred to Jesus as the master builder, and he said that there's other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He said, if any man build upon this foundation. And so what type of a life do we want to build? And so I want to look at the life of Jesus, the life that Jesus built, the bricks, if you will, of the life of Jesus. And the first is the brick of baptism. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus comes from Galilee to Jordan. He goes to John the Baptist to be baptized of him. And John the Baptist, maybe if you remember the story, forbade him, saying, I have need to baptize you, but yet you come to me. And what did Jesus say? He said, thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. In Mark chapter 1, we read the story that Jesus comes to be baptized of John. And coming up out of the water, the heavens were opened. And the Spirit descends like a dove. And the voice comes from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Why was this important? Because what is baptism a picture of? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus was surrendering to those things. Even as he was being baptized. Did Jesus need to be baptized for the sake of his own salvation? Certainly not. But it was a surrender. And in doing so, he set the example for us. The next brick, if you will, in the life of Jesus is that of temptation. In Matthew chapter 4, again, we know the story. Jesus is led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And the devil leaves him, the Bible says in verse 11, and behold, angels come and minister to him. Between the time that the devil leads him up and the devil leaves him, it's quite a story in Matthew chapter 4. And Jesus, by the way, was tempted as a man. He wasn't tempted as God. He was tempted as a man. You say, why? Because we would be tempted. And so, he's, again, he set an example for us. How did Jesus overcome temptation? With the word of God, he quoted the scripture. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 4 says, We have not an high priest which cannot be touched 
with the feelings of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The third brick is that of the house of worship. Of course, we all know the story. Also in Luke chapter 4, Jesus comes to Nazareth, which was his hometown. And the Bible says in verse 16, as his custom was. In other words, Jesus was in the habit of going to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Again, Jesus was setting the example for us. What did the apostle tell us in Hebrews chapter 10? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of, of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so that's an important brick to build your life with or upon. To build the house of your life upon is the house of worship. What did the psalmist say in Psalm 122? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Another brick, if you will, that Jesus built the house of his life upon was the brick of service. What did Jesus say when he was talking about the judgment of our lives? Matthew chapter 25. He said that some are going to look at him and they're going to say, well, you know, when did we do this or when did we do that? And Jesus is going to say, as much as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. I mean, what did Jesus commit his entire human life to? Serving others. And then there's that brick of prayer in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. It came to pass in those days that he went into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. What did Jesus teach his disciples? Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. What did the apostle tell us in 1 Thessalonians 5.17? Pray without ceasing. And then after the brick of prayer, there was the brick of despair. After the garden, after the time of prayer, what else happened? Luke chapter 22, verse 39. It says, he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. In other words, just as it was Jesus' custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, to go to church on Sunday, if you will, it was Jesus' custom at certain times to go to the Mount of Olives and pray, which is how Judas knew where to find him. And what did he do? He, he went to the place and his disciples followed him. And he said unto them, pray that you enter not into temptation. And then he went and he knelt down and he prayed, Father, you know, remove this cup from me. The psalmist prophesied of the moment in Psalm 27, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. But there was that brick of despair. I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was A.W. Tozer. I just remember the quote. I remember reading it in a book when I was in high school. That God will not use a man greatly until he has hurt him severely. And so... That's not just that brick of prayer, but that brick of despair. What's that saying into every life? Some rain must fall. God puts that rain in our lives for a reason. And then for Jesus, there was the brick of the cross in Hebrews 5.8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. There was the cross. There was suffering. You know, we're to take up our cross and follow Christ. Jesus said, if any man would follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So the cross isn't just a brick that Jesus had to use to build his house, but that we don't build our house with. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? You know, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. The next brick that Jesus built his life and his, the house of his life with was the valley of death. In Psalm 23 and verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know, the valley of the shadow of death. The shadow of death looks like death. That's what a shadow is. A shadow looks like something, but it has no substance. The shadow of death looks like death, but it doesn't have any substance. There's no real death there. There's no harm there. There's no harm in a shadow. It just looks scary. Not that Jesus' death on the cross wasn't real. It was. But he also knew that it was temporary, that he would conquer death, that he would rise from death. Because he rose from death, we'll rise from death. Because he conquered death, we'll conquer death. What did the apostle say? He said, I die daily. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And so death is just as much of a brick in our life as it was in the Lord's. And then lastly, there is the throne of God. What happened after Jesus died, after he rose again? It says that he ascended and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God the Father. Then what did he say to John in Revelation chapter 3? He said, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my Father in his throne. And so the bricks, if you will, that Jesus built his life upon the bricks that we can build our life with, and if we will, we'll build on a sure foundation. We'll build something that will last, that will withstand the fires of judgment as gold, silver, and precious stone. And so, Father, I thank you for the life of Jesus, and just pray that it would be our example and that we would build our life as our Lord built his and that we would build it upon, build it upon the rock, brick by brick, precept by precept, principle by principle. Pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd be glorified as we do. Pray that you'd bless our fellowship, bless our food. In your name, amen.